Welcome to Sputnik, orbiting the world with me, George Galloway. And me, Gayatri. HSBC bestrides the banking world like a colossus. But it's in big trouble. It has paid penalties of millions of dollars for doing business with Mexican drug cartels and other dodgy dealings. And that was before that old reliable of scandals, a Swiss banking imbroglio, burst upon the scene like a box of rotting eggs. A dirty laundry list as long as Oxford Street has been revealed involving some big names and even some members of Parliament. I, of course, am not one of them. But lords have been a-leaping. Lords we didn't know existed. Who knew that Britain was in part governed by someone called Lord Fink? I'm not making that up. But he was one of the tax dodgers, along with other lords and beneficiaries of trust funds set up by their billionaire fathers. It was not the attraction of Swiss cheese which drew them to Geneva, but rather the opportunity to either evade or avoid tax. Joining us now to survey the mountain of troubles surrounding this as an alternative economist of great distinction. Professor Steve Keen is the author of a wonderful book, Debunking Economics, and the head of school at Kingston University. Professor Keen, thanks. It's an honor for you to join us. You saw all this coming. Survey the rotting eggs for us, if you will. Oh, it's the banking sector is, as, as Marx and Keynes both separately put it, is a great servant and a terrible master. And what we've allowed happen in the last 50 years is they've gone from the days when the banks were effectively the servants of the, of the industrial sector, providing the money they needed for investment and so on, through to the stage where the masters, not just of the industrial sector, but the politicians as well. Indeed so. And uh, David Cameron ennobled the head mm. of HSBC, even though he must have known that this and other scandals were either in the pipeline or had burst wide open already. Well, there have been plenty of scandals in the financial sector all the way through. If you go back and look at even the, the formation of Citibank, that formation broke the law in America at the time. And if you know that hilarious photograph of Bill Clinton signing a document with a big smile on his face... I, he always as, had a big smile on his face. Almost as big as other times, and I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, surrounded by a whole bunch of people smiling financial faces. He was legalising an illegal act of forming a merger. Mm. Now, the, the classic statement about bankers, I think, was made by a West Australian uh, Premier many, many years ago talking about a particular uh, Ponzi schemer called Laurie Connell, and he was known as last resort, Laurie, in Western Australia, the last person. If you needed money, Laurie would provide it, but it would cost you an arm and a leg and a couple yeah. of other useful parts of your body. And uh, Laurie, you see, he's, he's, the Premier said, he wouldn't want to stand between Laurie Connell and a bucket of money. <laughs> now, banks are, by definition, buckets of money, and yeah. this sort of behaviour is just endemic in them when you let them get to be as big and as politically powerful as they've become under neoliberalism. That's what it is, isn't it? Uh, you put your finger on it. It's systemic. Yeah, it's it's systemic. not because you have a particular scoundrel no. heading this bank the or only thing another. I, the only thing HSBC did get, get wrong was being caught. Yeah, how well they caught, by well, the by way? By a whistleblower. And this is where it comes down to individuals having a sense of ethics that's far stronger than these institutions themselves have, who had access to the computer records, had the, the, the intelligence to know how to pull those records out and then got arrested... In, in Switzerland, managed to get out on bail and then jumped countries, got to France, and here you have to have great respect for the French authorities. When they saw what he had, they wouldn't get, didn't get extradited back to Switzerland, where it would have all completely disappeared if they'd taken him back there. So the French looked at it and they saw the amount of evasion going on. And the French said, this is, a, is in a sense, a gold mine for us. We know we haven't been getting the tax revenues from the wealthy. Now we know a large part of the reason why. Let's prosecute this. And the English who normally I respect for the extent to which they allow political liberalism, pretty much completely ignored the information coming across from the French until the press broke it in the last few months. Well, this is another important point you've put your finger on, because the contradiction here is that the state 
any state mm. needs this money really badly. Yeah. So they're caught uh, in a kind of uh, paradigm in which their neoliberal instincts mm. are to allow the rich to run rampant. Yeah. But their bills, their uh, debits as states require going after these tax avoidance. I know, and what it tends to happen is they don't go after them. Instead, they impose strictures upon the working class and the middle class who can't get away, and they cut back on the services we get so they have less, less of a gap between their, their taxation and their, and their spending. So this is a classic case where I, th I look back and see been brilliant statements in the past. Remember, of course, the phrase the military-industrial complex mm. was coined by President Eisenhower. Of all like people. A, of all people. I think he was wrong, unfortunately, because the military-industrial complex is a far better beast to run you than what I call the politico-financial complex well, we now have. Jo there's more real jobs. Uh, there's more real uh, jobs. In, in At least they, you know, they make stuff and they blow it up later. But in the case of the financial sector, they create nothing. They create Ponzi schemes. And the, the politicians have now got so used to a financial sector at the scale of the sector we now have that they can't imagine it any other way. So we go through a financial crisis and what is their first response after the panic spending that stopped us going into a complete Great Depression. Their first response is to rescue the financial sector and get it back to the scale back it was to what it was had. before, and before and it brought us to the edge of the cliff. Yeah, and yet at the same time, when you try to talk about policies which might actually benefit the ordinary person, things like what I call quantitative easing for the people or a modern debt jubilee, you're told, well, that's going to raise moral hazard. What on earth do they think they've I, been I, doing? I don't know if there's any minister left with the chutzpah to use the phrase moral hazard, uh -huh. because morality uh, was the first casualty well and truly. Uh, of all of this. We're trapped in what someone once called the great money trick, mm. the great money illusion. Yeah. Tell us what an alternative economy would look like. Well, I mean, there's plenty of people putting out uh, proposals which effectively are trying to stop the financial sector having the capacity to create money, which is where this largely emanates from. Uh, and what that means is who else creates money? And that gives you the government as the only other possible source of money creation. Now, the government has been deliberately falling down on its job <laughs> because they don't think they should do that anymore, so they've handed the whole responsibility over this to the private sector. because of neoliberal ideology. Because of neoliberal ideology. ideology yeah. the, the nonsense of economic vision that conventional economics has, which talks and tells us how to run the monetary system while their models themselves largely ignore the existence of bank's debt and money completely. Mm. It's ironic that they do that. But... There is nonetheless a need for private money creation and a need for government money creation. We live in a mixed economy. You need both of them to happen. But you want that money creation to be done sensibly, wisely. Now, the trouble is the bigger these banks get, the less they know about the customers they deal with. They go from back in the old days of the Jimmy Stewart style bank where he knew everybody in the town, he knew whose idea was likely to be a good one and whose... He knew their dog, bad. he knew their granny. Yeah, and this was a large part of the old uh, Glass-Steagall Act uh, by breaking American banks down, making them regional and giving them just, just a very tiny physical fief over which they had the capacity to crew, issue loans and therefore create money, they largely did it for successful businesses, businesses they had some feeling were going to be successful. So there's personal knowledge on the half of the, the managers and so on. And I've come to realise over time, I didn't think it was all that important looking back on it, but when you look at what's happened now, you've gone from that level to where it's credit scoring and point systems. And I've been contacted by people who write the software that does the point scoring system for some of the banks in Australia and they're now selling it globally. And they tell me that it's a 20 second process to go from somebody applying for it to working how much collateral they have to deciding to give them alone, that is the sort of thing that gives you bubbles and Ponzi schemes and the capacity for banks to behave illegally and call it management, call it banking. So I, I think we have to go back to the days when banks were small. The whole idea of large banks itself is a problem. And we have to go back to the point where banks largely only make their money by lending to genuine businesses because instead what they're doing, they're creating money if we need them to do, but they're creating money into the housing sector, into the share markets, et cetera, et cetera. All they're doing is inflating asset bubbles and a remainder washes over into the real economy. But we don't get that creative generation of new businesses that we should be getting out of their capacity to create money. Everybody should know what a Ponzi scheme is, <laughs> but they don't. Uh, is it a kind of pyramid selling? A Ponzi scheme is a, is a scheme where you make money by getting more money coming in than you're dealing out, but you're actually not producing anything in the middle, or largely. So Charles Ponzi is, the, of course, the classic for it. 
believe that he worked out a way to make money up through arbitrage of stamps back in the 19, late 1910s. And what he realised was there were these, the stamp uh, authorities globally enabled you to buy a stamp with an American dollar and then get a stamp in Italy when you sent to get a, a, a return post. And he realised that because of the change in currency values after the First World War, there was a huge gap. It was cheaper to buy them in Italy and bring them to America. So that was his actual way to try to make money. He never managed to organise it. He promised people a 50% return in 45 days and the 46th day elapsed before it even worked out the scheme. So the next, the first depositor turns up wanting his money back, he gave them the money from the second and third depositor. Yeah, yeah. So they grow and then they collapse. And that's, in a sense, I see the housing so, sector as the same thing. Yeah, yeah it's a pretty good uh, description of, mm. uh, of our situation. Mm. Well, Gatry. Having said that uh, the HSBC scandal is systematic, mm. HSBC being the largest bank in Britain, mm. which bank is next? And can well, we... <laughs> can, I mean, we which, have which, which bank houses in its bowels... Uh, ethical, honest whistleblower with access to computer technology. It's as simple as I that. I don't know. That's all it comes down to. The British government is blocking an inquiry into yeah. the HSBC scandal. Yeah. Yeah. Can you imagine not holding in an inquiry into something that might be done by a Labor council somewhere? Of mm. course they'll do it. Mm. When you get this huge thing by people who are donors to the political party in power, oh, why bother? Well, uh, I guess, I mean, you, 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 you've, you've identified several key points and in a way that's the one we'll have to close on. Mm. This is entirely circular. Politicians go and work for these banks mm. when they cease being politicians. Yeah. The bankers make huge donations to mm -hmm. the politicians when they're politicians. And the politicians legislate for a framework, an inquiry or no inquiry, mm -hmm. to the benefit of the people who helped them get into power in the first place and will employ them later. Yeah. It's a rotten uh, a box of eggs, this, isn't it? It is indeed, but if they were going to go work for Jimmy Stewart, they wouldn't get paid enough and it wouldn't happen. We need to go back to small banks. Professor, I really encourage everyone to get this book. It's published by Zed, mm -hmm. and it's called Debunking Economics. Uh, the, now, there's a question mark. It says, the emperor dethroned question mark. It's the question mark that interests me. Yeah, uh, I, if, I wonder... I were, if we were lucky enough still to be here in 20 years, are we still going to be in this mess? Well, Yanis Varoufakis, being a good friend of mine, caught in the same situation. The feeling you might still be caught there is why he's pushing for reform rather than revolution. And I think the same thing. I think I'm going to be stuck with a question mark. I'd like to have an exclamation mark one of these days, but I'm never confident about that. Me too. I'm looking forward to that <laughs> exclamation mark. <laughs> Professor Steve Keen, you're a real star turn, I must say. You make economics understandable to ordinary people, and that's not common. Thanks Thank for you. joining us mm -hmm. on The Sputnik. Coming up after the break, it's almost 50 years since the killing fields in Indonesia, my own country. Millions were murdered. And if you want to know by whom and what happened next, it's all coming up after the break. Welcome back to Sputnik. In 1967, Indonesia's founding father, President Sukarno, was overthrown in a U.S. organized coup. One of the organizers, Henry Kissinger, still alive. The military seized power, appointed the dictator Suharto, who then proceeded to massacre millions of Sukarno supporters. The Act of Killing, a film by Joshua Oppenheimer, which has won awards all over the world, represents the only international recognition of the crimes against humanity which were carried out in those days. It is a part of world history, however, that we are determined to recover and to try and hold to account the perpetrators, alive or dead. Joining us now is Dr. Su Chen Marching, who's working on a memoir of that period. Dr. Su, thank you for joining us. Uh, the act of killing brought to an international audience for the first time in 50 years. The massacre, which has not been seen since the Holocaust, of millions yes. of people. Yes in an important country, uh, the, uh, one of the most populous countries in the world, yet almost nobody knows anything about it. That adds insult to injury, doesn't it? Oh, yes, of course. And not only that, um, even now, they're still in power, even. and they, they As can... a vice president, even. Yeah, yes, yeah. exactly. And the victims and their families are still stigmatised and even prosecuted, you know. Tell us what happened. In 1965, what happened was there was um, in um, 
On the 1st of October, there was a murder of generals. And the Communist Party was blamed for that. And then the blame was not only on the Communist Party, but also the Communists as a whole, and also the left-wing sympathizers. And my father was one of the victims. He was imprisoned. And there was basically murder squads uh, roaming yes. the streets, looking for first people who were communists and second people who were Indonesians of Chinese ethnicity. Yes, and left-wing sympathizers. Because left they were thought to be the base of the left. Yes, and left-wing sympathizers. And not only left-wing sympathizers, actually. Anyone um, could be murdered or could be imprisoned if, if the, the official says, if the officials just point their fingers to them. That's it. They, they would be booked. And um, the, the number of the people murdered is still not really known. Now some mention one million, some two million, some three millions. But the one, commander... One, two or three million. Exactly. These, it's these like it doesn't matter are, for are, them. are, are almost in, <laughs> incomprehensible yes, yes. Uh, to people. In the act of killing, we saw some of the perpetrators not only describe what they did, but act it out. Yeah, they boast. <laughs> they <laughs> boasted of it yeah, and they boast. acted it out, how yes. they killed people with piano wire and yes. decapitated yes. And they tell people. And they tell about this while walking about in the shopping mall with their family. Yes, that's a problem because they are proud of it, because they are seen as heroes and they see themselves as heroes. That's the problem, right? Because the victims are still victimized, are still um, stigmatized. So that's why the perpetrators have this opportunity to say that we are heroes. And this is the problem for me. If the government hasn't done anything and doesn't want to do anything, then that's why we have to do something. And um, at the moment, that's why we, we have um, established this uh, organization called IPT65, International People Tribunals Against the um, Genocide in 1965. And this, this tribunal is, is based where? It's based in, um, in the Netherlands. Mm. So it started yeah. there. It's, it, actually, it started um, because of the film um, by Joshua Oppenheimer, yeah. The Act of Killing. And then we just thought, look, is this all? We must do something after this, right? We must take action. And if the government doesn't do anything, then we, the people, have to do something. So that's, why, that's what we did. We um, established this. And um, by RPT 65, it means that this is a court case held by the people. Yes, a people's tribunal. Of yeah, course, I'm familiar with the, with, yeah. the, with the model. Yeah. The, how did it come to pass that the Communist Party in Indonesia, which was one of the biggest in the whole world... Third. Third, third biggest in Communist the Party yeah, in the whole world. Outside of uh, Russia and China, China. Yes. yes. after Russia and China, yes. Indonesia's party was the biggest. Mm -hmm. It had millions of supporters, many millions of supporters, because Indonesia is a big place. Yes. Uh, uh, how was it able to be crushed so comprehensively? Still illegal, yes. doesn't exist. Yes. The left doesn't exist yes. in Indonesia. Yeah. 50 years later, yeah. there is no left. Mm -hmm. uh, and when one talks, as I have, mm. to a Indonesian Chinese, I ask them if they were Chinese. They were really shocked, scandalized, that I would <laughs> ask them they were... Yeah instinctively afraid of that question yes, yeah, because yeah. of the witch hunt mm. against people of Chinese. They would say, no, no, I'm Indonesian. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. How, how did this happen? Was it like uh, salami, that the people were taken uh, one by one in small slices? Why did the party, why was the party not able to defend itself? They were not ready, and they didn't know that this would happen, I think. Because uh, my, my, my father... This is, this is the story of my father. My mom kept telling me that he was not involved in the Communist Party. He was only in the um, left-wing organization. He didn't really know what happened. Only two years ago, my mother told me something else. She called me and she said, look, your father was actually one of the committee members of the Indonesian Communist Party. One of the leaders. So they kept this from you all this time? They kept this as a secret. One of the committee members, it's not like a big one. He's not like an important one. And that's why he was not murdered. And he was just appointed um, just before the genocide happened. So not many people found out about it. And my mom burned all of the papers. So that's why he was not murdered. But he didn't know anything. So they weren't ready. They didn't know what was going on. So when the genocide happened, they got confused. Also the people... Well, it's were... the job of a communist to know what's going on. Why did no one come to their aid? Why did China not come to their aid? Why did the Soviet Union not come to their aid? Was it impossible in the world balance of 
power at that time? I think it was it was it was just a matter of benefit. If it didn't disadvantage them, they wouldn't they wouldn't do anything. I think, and it didn't really uh, you know advantage anyone to defend Indonesia at that time. I think. Why was and, the U.S. so determined to get rid of Sukarno? Well, because Indonesia was really in a way you know it, it was a big country, and if it became communist, it was dangerous for the West. And for China and Russia to oppose the West, maybe it was just too impossible for them. They, they, have, they had to consider the gain then. Because but in Sukarno's time, Indonesia was really something, yeah? Mm. It had hosted the Bandung Conference. Oh, yes. Oh, it yes. had become a pole yes. around which much of the so-called non-aligned yes. movement mm. uh, was, uh, was uh, orbiting. Uh, and uh, therefore... A decision was made in Washington. I mean, I know you want to instinctively want to blame the actual perpetrators, mm -hmm. but the masterminds of this massacre were in Washington. Well, you can say that, yes. We can say that this is actually in Washington because the CIA had been planning it for years and years and years. But um, with the IEPT, actually, we don't concentrate on the perpetrators and who, who, who was... Um, in a way, who was the mastermind or everything. We concentrate on the victims to rehabilitate them. That's, that's more important for them, us at, at the moment. back in society. Yes, to get back the society and to, to basically to be admitted, you know, to, for the government to admit that they are victims yeah. and stop stigmatizing them. Because, um, you know, I've seen the movie The Railway Man, actually, and there the victim met, meets the perpetrator. He can only forgive the perpetrator when the perpetrator says, yes, you have been victimized, and I am sorry for that. Before then, it's impossible. What know, about compensation? Uh, people mm. lost their fathers, their husbands, their brothers, mothers, sisters. They lost property. They lost their businesses. Yes. Uh, Indonesia is a very rich country. Yes. Shouldn't people be financially compensated? I think so. I do believe in that, that people have to be compensated, but that's a long way from yeah. what, what we they expect. This is like, we, you know, if, <clears throat> if, if the victims are still stigmatized, they have to be acknowledged first as victims, and they're still really angry. They, you know, a lot of them are depressed. And I, I mean, I can't really blame them for being angry. Mm. What about the new president now? Uh, he's not a leftist, uh, but, uh, but he, he stands out. He leans in the direction of Sukarno's ideas. Yes. Uh, although his vice president is one of the criminals. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm quite disappointed with it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, are you likely to get any justice from the new president of Indonesia? I was hopeful, to be honest. But now I start doubting him. He is still much, much better than his opponent, you know, than Prabowo. Obviously. You know, much better. General. And I, 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 I don't regret um, voting electing him, him, voting no. for him. But... Um, I start doubting it, and I think, um, you know, doubting doesn't mean that you don't do anything. We have to do more. Mm. You know, we have to make an effort because... Well, he, that... he'll, he'll only be able to do anything if there's a big swell of popular exactly. uh, support for what Exactly, we have to do something. We have to keep voicing whatever, you know, um, we believe in and, and to push the, the government. And that's why this is the, the function of IPD um, 1965. We want to put pressure on the government and on the United Nations. Look, you know, this is important. Mm. And why you keep quiet? Yeah. Well, Indonesia was once great under Sukarno. Mm -hmm. Let's hope it can return to center stage in world events in the next uh, period. Good luck Hopefully. with your tribunal. If there's thank anything you. we can do to help, we're more than happy oh, to do so. Oh, thank you, George. Thank you, Putri. Dr. Su so Cheng, yeah. marching. Thank you very much Thank indeed you. for joining us on the Sputnik. And now it's your turn to tell us what you think through the portals of social media. What's right then, Gayatri? Well, we received a tremendous response on the act of killing that we promoted on Twitter, which is good. So a lot of people have seen it. And Oliver Volker says, this film is excellent. I was in, it was in German TV last year. No one is accountable, of course, because the killers were on our side, like Blair and Bush. It's important to emphasize, the act of killing is a film like no other. It is the Sistine Chapel of films. It is Michelangelo. Joshua Oppenheimer is a genius. He has captured in a movie a story of such epic proportions and bizarre and perverse character. He's captured this in a movie. If there's anybody out there who has not yet seen the act of killing, I beg them 
to see it. Neat. I tweeted at the time, as you'll recall, I'm rarely speechless, but after watching this film, you were in tears. I am literally speechless, as well as you say, with tears running down our face. Well, it's needless to say that it was, of course, not allowed. It was banned in Indonesia, so it was, you know, underground. It was shown underground, but obviously only to targeted people. The mass audience, the mass of the public in Indonesia, they just don't know about it. It's no. been completely well, kept. The mass and, of the public everywhere don't know about it. And that's why it. Jack Tipple says an anti-PKI film was shown every year on national TV in Indonesia until very recently, PKI being the Indonesian Communist Party. Mm. And that's the problem. That's the norm in Indonesia, which is obviously very saddening. And that's all that we've got for this week. Which means, alas, that's the end of the show. You can stay in touch with us on Twitter, RT underscore Sputnik, and on Facebook, Sputnik on Russia Today. It's goodbye from me, Gayatri. And from me, George Galloway. It's been marvellous.